be, I'm leaving tomorrow morning for like a 7 a.m. flight, so I'll just be here today, though. Okay, everybody, we're going to get um, started again. Area. Sometimes I hear them out loud enough. Okay, everybody, we're going to get started again. If you could uh, call your friends in from outside. Even the people you don't care for that much. So this is the PHI breach response session. The incomparable Stu Panensky uh, will be your moderator. And Stu, I'll let you do the formal introduction. Hold your applause. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody. So this is the PHI data breach panel, and we have a very talented panel and uh, set of panelists that are going to share their knowledge and information on the subject. Um, to my left is Jamie May from All Clear ID. Jamie's the vice president of operations there and has significant experience uh, responding to healthcare breaches and is uh, quite an entrepreneur. Uh, to her left is Rich Sheridan. Rich is the Vice President of Claims of Access Pro. Rich has a lot of experience in handling privacy, cyber, and technology claims for Access and his predecessor companies. Uh, Paul Nickinson is to Rich's left. Paul is the uh, Breach Response Manager for Beasley and handles, uh, uh, gives advice to policyholders regarding responding to breaches and uh, different kinds of breaches, including PHI. And to Paul's left is Peggy Myers. Peggy is an independent uh, healthcare consultant who has a lot of years of experience as an executive in the healthcare field um, and dealing with uh, PHI risk and data breach response. And finally, all the way at the end is Peggy Lee. Peggy is the supervisor in investigation and enforcement for the Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Health and Human Services, as we affectionately call OCR, and will uh, share information from the government's perspective when dealing with the PHI risk. So we're here talking about uh, PHI. Well, why are we here? What are we talking about? Uh, this is health data. We're talking PHI which is very different than other kinds of protected information. Um, definitionally, it's just information that relates to future physical or mental health. Um, but there is inherent value in PHI that is not present, present in other kinds of information that's protected. And the example that I always use when I talk about the inherent value of medical information, of health information, is with the example of if you had a spouse or a child with an addiction or with a mental illness and that's a sensitive issue and you don't want that information out in the public sphere to the extent that a PHI record is breached um, dealing with that sensitive information you can't put a toothpaste back in the tube it's out there now and there's value in that and that's real damages that's Article 3, constitutionally recognized area of damages. So it's, it's different than other kinds of protected information. Um, we wanted to talk about the next slide. I know it's really difficult to read, and I know we just came from a, um, a hacker presentation, but what that uh, image is is a screenshot of a Tor uh, website, and that screenshot is offering to sell stolen medical records in the United States. So it's out there, it's on the black market, in the, on the Tor uh, browser, on the Onion sites. You can buy stolen medical records, you can use it to defraud the government, defraud insurers, or to steal identities. And um, that's, that's one of the reasons why we're here and one of the reasons we're talking about PHI. Um, Paul, I think you had some experience dealing with, with this. Uh, would you tell us about it? Sure, Stu. So uh, Tor, which is, which is the term Stu used, which is the onion router, it's a, it's a way of accessing what, what you hear referred to as the, the dark web um, anonymously. So um, on the dark web, which is essentially the part of the internet that's not indexed by the major search engines, you probably have heard about this, uh, 
quite, quite often these days, uh, you see a treasure trove of information. Anything and everything is for sale. It's a very defined, robust market. It, it has the supply and demand. As big breaches happen, that information is uploaded. It's chopped up and sold. It's very easy to obtain just about anything you want. Um, prices fluctuate as, as they do with any other market. If you were to access uh, this, this part of the internet, which you probably shouldn't do from your, your corporate network, um, you would see something, that, that's one screenshot from one forum, but you would see many that look eerily like eBay. They're actually structured to work exactly the same. There's credibility ratings, there's sellers who will front you some data to show it's legitimate. So it's a, it's a very robust market, and it's a multi-billion dollar market, and it attracts some very clever, smart people that go to uh, do business there on, on this type of information specifically. And statistically speaking, uh, at least as of 2014 and 2015, the value of a stolen medical record is more expensive to purchase on the Tor browser than stolen credit card information. So and there's I, a market for yeah, it. Yeah, and I think that, that ebbs and flows, right? A, a big breach happens in the healthcare setting, the value of PHI goes down, payment card breach uh, doesn't happen for a while, value of payment card data goes up, it's a market just like any other. While HIPAA and high tech are always in the foreground and in the spotlight on discussions involving healthcare and PHI, there is a set of concurrent exposures to your policyholders and your clients involving the state regimes, the state laws and the state attorneys general. And if you are giving advice or you're, you're underwriting this, you have to be cognizant of both the HIPAA and high tech exposure, which we'll cover in a second, as well as these concurrent state regimes. Um, Rich, uh, have you had experience dealing where, where there's exposures to both, um, uh, to one of your insurers in both the uh, HIPAA high-tech context as well as a state AG? Well, yes, and um, w we see it in you know, many states, as we have up on the board, have statutes that uh, allow for schemes for regulators to go after companies that have had breaches that have been, you know, the issues in, in their protection of data that have caused the breaches. Um, and many of these states are also states where the AG's office are very active and aggressive in pursuing actions um, un under their state statutes um, to protect their citizens. Um, most of them allow for regulatory schemes that allow the AG's to pursue, um, but in California, where they have the Confidenti Confidentiality of Medical Information Act, or CMIA, um, there is a private cause of action, and if you get a big breach in California potentially involving medical data, you will almost always see a, a class action or multiple class action suits uh, in, in that area. And we've seen some litigation, I've seen that on the claims end, uh, you know, under the CMIA, private causes of action, and there, are, there is a statutory damage scheme, it's uncapped as well, so there is p potentially large exposure. Uh, fortunately, uh, the courts have trended towards um, finding or not finding that that data has been released. If there's something like a lost laptop, you need a little bit more to establish causes of action under the CMIA, or at least the, the courts have found that. Um, one significant exception, which we'll be talking about a little bit later, is the Stanford Hospital matter, um, which resulted in a large settlement. Hey, uh, state, state AGs love this issue. It's a political hot button. Who doesn't want to be perceived to be tough on privacy? It's a, it's a really big issue for, for AGs out there, and um, you know, everyone know what AG stands for? It's, it's almost governor, right? It's, it's, a, it's a good way to get into political office, it really is. Yeah. And they said you shouldn't tell jokes. Uh, Tom told me not to tell a joke, but I, I ignored that. But, but Paul, you said before when we were preparing that um, a lot of your policyholders, they know HIPAA, they know high tech. Is there as much familiarity with the different state Laws. No, this is a really messy patchwork, a quilt of, of regulations of laws. I, we in California here had the very first one uh, to, to some extent on breach notification. All the other states that have followed have either tried to just one-up us or be purposefully annoying with some other scheme that conflicts with our scheme. So it's a, it's a very difficult web to navigate as, as an, a client, particularly if this is your first go, you know, your first encounter with, with breaches, breach notification, it's quite challenging. So we talked uh, by reference HIPAA and high tech and what we're talking about and just, just for background, I know this is a very sophisticated audience, is the security rule which 
uh, provides for administrative, physical, and technical safeguards. In other words, it provides for the covered entity to affirmatively have in place administrative, physical, and technical safeguards, protecting your information systems, um, your IT systems, developing pol uh, the appropriate in-house policies, uh, physical security, making sure your workstation and, and people have physical uh, limitations on their access to the computers, and of course, uh, you know, audits and, and authentication and all the stuff that we heard in the hacking uh, panel a few moments ago. But what we really wanted to talk about here, because we, again, our, our, our experience is that the clients and the policyholders, they know HIPAA really well, they know what they have to do, but there's, um, I hear anecdotally from my clients that it's really, it's not them, it's the business associate that is really the cause of most of the breaches. And we saw a statistic that came out um, in 2014 that said 75% of all healthcare breaches were actually caused by the business associate and not by the covered entity. Holly, uh, what's your experience in, in that regard? I think what we see is the fingers are pointing both ways. In healthcare, and it makes no difference if it's a 100-bed hospital or 500-bed hospital, is a lot of times the organization does not have a really good handle on who are their business associates. You know, we think that there is a very standardized contract that talks about, you know, if this happens, you'll be responsible for notification, you'll have to do this. But I can tell you in a lot of smaller healthcare organizations, especially in long-term care markets, it could be a handshake. Or it could be, yeah, we'll have a, um, an associate's agreement, and it might be that's who your IT provider is. And I think what, until a breach happens, people really do not have a great handle on who all their associates really are. And this is what we've seen, especially in healthcare, that it could have been somebody's doing the health physicals or they're doing the lab work for the company that only has 20 employees. And it could have been something through that associate, or if it happens that the healthcare organization is doing it. You know, now they're telling the business associate it's their responsibility. This whole idea of who owns the data is, is a major problem in healthcare, I see. The perfect example is you go to your doctor, he says, you need to have your lab, you know, your lab work done. So you go to the hospital, you go to the clinic. The lab work is done, goes back to your doctor. The hospital or clinic has a breach. So now who owns that data? Is it the hospital that owns the data, or is it back at your physician's office? And I think that's what we see going on, especially with this happen, is who really is the person responsible for notification? And I can tell you, unless it's a, a large company, they have really very unsophisticated IP, IT departments and really have no clue about what to do when it comes to really doing breach notification. And in most cases, it's kind of like we talked about Anthem earlier today. You know, it's the hospital that goes ahead and, and, and does it or the clinic that goes ahead and does all notification. But sometimes, too, you have very limited information. It could be you have the name of the person, no other information is available. So it can be a, a very difficult situation to go through. Peggy, talk about the role of the agreement, of the contract between the covered entity and the business associate. I think it's very important to understand the importance of the business associate agreement because I think what you're talking about is exactly the problem that we're seeing is that you have a lot of um, not just business associates, but don't forget the sub-business associates. So for a covered entity who may have a variety of business associates, they're all looking at the trickle-down effect and they don't really know who is down there. They have to get more than assurances nowadays. I think business associate agreements, you can use the template one, it's on our website, but it's very bare. It doesn't consider the specifics of the covered entity and the business associate. So for example, who's going to do the reporting? Who's going, how, who do you report to? What are your procedures on that? Is there a form you have or you just make a phone call, an email? How soon do you have to do it? It may be that California has 15 days and you know HIPAA has 60 days, but you know, when are you going to hear from your business associate? Is it going to be on day 59? Because they're thinking, oh, we just have to follow HIPAA. Or do you want them to report to you sooner, as soon as they find out, before they even do anything? Who's going to bear the responsibility? Where's the liability? Maybe you don't want the business associate to do it, because as you said, they're not sophisticated. But on the other hand, the covered entity doesn't have the information they need to do a full incident report of any sort. And how do you respond? How do you determine what the risk is to the data? And for us, it's not so much who owns the data, but what is the risk to the data? because ultimately it is the covered entity's data, and that's what it comes down to. So I think the covered entity really needs to take an upper hand and say, okay, what are we gonna do beforehand? What is our process gonna be? Who's gonna take responsibility? What are we gonna do afterwards? 
Um, and I think all these other organizations, like you know, all clear, clear ID and breach risk, you know, um, assessments and management is very important because there's a lot of work to be done in a short amount of time. I would also submit that covered entities have more bargaining leverage during negotiations than the business associate in most cases. And with the better leverage comes greater responsibility. And what we've heard uh, from regulators like yourself is that they look at that and they see if you were in a better position to, 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 to take these precautions, then it, the owner should fall on you. Absolutely. You know, before Omnibus, we were, when we would receive a complaint and the covered entity would say to us, oh, you know, there was a theft, but it was at the business associate office. We would say, okay, so who do we contact over there? And if we can't get the information from them, we go to them first. We go to the covered entity and say, okay, get us their, you know, do they have a risk analysis? Do they, what are their safeguards? What are they putting into place? Um, and sometimes they would come back and say, well, call them and ask. And we'd say, we're asking you because you're the one who's responsible. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. So if you have a contract, you're signing with someone, either you know what they're doing or you can get it, the information. Because we're not going to go to the business associates to ask for it. Okay. Uh, well, we're going to move on now and talk about the greater risks or the broader risks in uh, handling PHI and, and dealing with PHI claims. Um, aside from legal, Holly, what other potential exposures, risks, or expenses do your uh, healthcare professionals face, your healthcare services face? I think I'll talk about the risk portion of it and the rest of the panel can chime in with some of the additional costs. But I think the things that are really unique in healthcare, and it was mentioned earlier today, is that the amount of data that healthcare is now being required, you know, by the government and by the insurers and by everybody else has just, you know, tenfold. You know, all documentation, all physician ordering, you know, your entire medical record now has to be computerized. When I hate to say it, but in the olden days when it was the paper chart, you know, we didn't have to worry about somebody hacking into that, you, you know, that was not an issue. You Years ago, but now the amount of stuff that we have that's on a computer is is really at the highest risk there ever has been, and it will continue to be. I think also too there is this feeling out there, and in, in some healthcare organizations, is that unless I'm a Cleveland Clinic or I'm a Mayo Clinic, what do they want to get from my little hundred bed hospital that's sitting in the middle of nowhere? And I, I think there is this false sense is that, well, what are they going to take from me? I don't have, you know, I'm not doing research. I'm not doing this. Who is going to worry about us? And I do, I do feel that there is a very big false sense of security out there. And a lot of organizations choose not to purchase the insurance or else they may have the, the local, nothing against attorneys in this room, but the, the local attorney who happens to be, you know, their in-house counsel who is on a retainer says, oh, they're not going to worry about you. So I, I do think think that's a major risk in healthcare. You know, I think we've seen, you know, and we know there's a lot of obviously breaches out in healthcare, but I, I think that there is this different sense of security that maybe, you know, a bigger company would not have. Also, reputation is a main issue. There's always going to be a reputation thing, be it Target or Home Depot or whatever else. But if you're sitting in your community hospital, first of all, you're only going to go to your hospital, you're going to go to your doctor because you're in a vulnerable state. So who are you trusting? I mean, you are trusting that organization to go there to take care of you. And taking care of you means taking care of your health, but also every other thing about you. So I think that puts a different twist on this whole reputation building. And I'm sure many of us in this audience sit in, organ sit in communities where you've got competing medical centers. And so if you know, medical center A has a breach happen, I've, I've seen it, where medical center B has the big public thing, well, you know, that doesn't happen here. We've never had a breach happen to us. They must be sloppy you know, in what they're doing. And then I, I do think you see when it comes to the IT departments, and this is probably not atypical, but all the confidence is put into the IT head, their CIO, or it, in many cases it is a business associate who is doing their IT and just says, you know, there's, there's nothing that's going to happen to us. You know, we've got the best things there possible. So I do think with healthcare there is this false sense of security, unless we're the big boys out there playing, that we are going to be really kind of immune to all these things happening to us. Jamie, you have your boots in the field far more than any of us sitting here in the ivory tower do. Uh, what steps do you take to determine an appropriate response um, when confronted with a healthcare breach? Sure. 
So, um, you know, one of the additional aspects when we're talking about cost as well um, for a PHI breach is we typically see a much stronger customer reaction to these types of breach compared to other ones where financial information or PH PCI information um, was exposed. So um, a, a lot more phone calls, a lot more escalations, angry callers, and uh, higher take rates on the identity protection services. And when you say customer, you mean the ultimate customer, the, the person whose record may have been exposed? The affected individual. So um, there's a lot of confusion around PHI information being exposed, so customers don't inherently understand the um, implications of certain types of those pieces of information being out in the wild. So what is the risk to me if it's my um, health uh, insurance benefits information or my diagnosis information, and what's the appropriate remedy for me for that information, um, you know, if it is exposed. So um, higher response rates typically can drive up the cost for the, the parts of uh, the response that include customer notification, support, and identity protection. And then um, to the question of when you're responding to one of these events, uh, time is always a huge factor. So um, you know the, the notification requirements vary state by state. Um, so some of the tightest timelines, you know, 15 days, but even if you're talking about 60 days, it can be really difficult to launch a massive response if you're talking about an organization with a lot of records um, in that time frame. So, um, you know, making sure that there's adequate um, support resources available to respond to all the demand generated by that type of notification, you know, it can be really difficult to pull off in, in the time frame. So there has to be a plan in place. There has to be um, a, a practice plan in place. Uh, otherwise, you're, uh, you're going to fall flat. Is it fair to presume then that with more escalations from the impacted uh, person and with more uh, calls to the call center that there is an accompanying increase in costs? Yeah, absolutely. So the more demand on the service, the higher the cost is going to be. And, and if I could just chime in real quick on a PHI breach, if HIPAA is implicated, the notification is going gonna, is gonna to be by mail, it's required, so that'll be an additional cost. Um, and one of the things I've seen is that on a, on a PHI breach, I think you're much more likely to, if you just have an individual affected, you're much more likely to see uh, litigation arising out of a single person breach than you ever would be with, you know, with, a, with a PCI or a PII breach. And one, one final point is, uh, on a typical breach, you know, what, it, particularly involving you know, PCI or, or PII, um, you'll, you'll be uh, offering credit monitoring, well, maybe not after um, the Neiman Marcus decision, but um, in, in a PHI breach, I'm not sure that um, yeah, credit monitoring really does anything. Um, you know, I was talking to Jamie a little bit beforehand, and you know, basically see if there's any kind of a medical credit monitoring product that's out there. So. So there, there's no um, equivalent to credit monitoring for health information, and that's probably a good thing that all of our health records are not in one centralized location to be monitored. Um, but there are other solutions that more appropriately address the risks associated with different types of breaches. So whether that's credit card information or healthcare information. Um, so you know, credit monitoring certainly isn't one size fits all. Um, and it's uh, probably not the most appropriate solution um, if it is just health care information and not social security numbers. And the forensic spend on these incidents is significant. I mean, if you look at some of the, the leading security firms that publish stats on, on this, you'll see about a 200-day period between the attacker intruding and somebody discovering the attacker in the system. So you think about what it what can be done in a 200-day period and how long it will take to get a very... Um, uh, you know, a very unique team of specialists deployed to reverse engineer exactly what happened, those costs mount extremely quickly. Another cost, too, is, is the human capital of the organization itself. When you have this breach, you're talking about a, a very tiny, tiny group of core people. Usually it is an exec in charge, and their life basically becomes that breach. And even though these people normally have other jobs, that becomes the focus of them. The time is spent with the IT departments trying to work through before forensics even comes in and realize that they have a cost 
with it. And then even with what Jamie talked about is if there is credit and monitoring, you still have to have escalation teams at your own sites. So if, you know, there's a call center through All Clear or, or similar companies, is there still has to be somebody who is there locally that's doing this. The amount of money that is spent in overtime or really uncompensated time really is sometimes even unmeasurable because of the type of people that are involved in doing this. I want to go back to that question about uh, that issue raised with forensics that you raised with forensics, Paul. Um, the, is there a potential, uh, I'm trying to rephrase this question, um, we, we, we're not going to talk a lot about coverage on this panel, but what happens hypothetically if the forensic investigation proves something that would take the matter out of being afforded coverage? All right, I'll jump on that. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, reluctantly. Um, <laughs> I should also state, Rich, before we get started, I meant to do this when we did the introductions. We have to have a general disclaimer up here that the opinions that the individual in these panels offer are not reflective of their principal organizations. This especially applies to Peggy. So, <laughs> but you too. Yep. Thank you, sir. Um, you can have situations where uh, you, you need to kind of have a forensics company go in and look at a situation. Uh, that may not ultimately trigger coverage under the policy. And, and an example that I can give in, in the medical sector was um, a matter where there was a medical practice was noticed, uh, actually noticed their carrier based on a situation where they had uh, about 40% of the members of the practice had over a couple of weeks all had, uh, had payment uh, credit cards breached among the practice, and it appeared that the practice itself had been breached, and a forensics company was hired, went in, ch checked their systems, and as it turned out, uh, the system was clean, there was no evidence of infiltration. As it turned out, in that particular locale, there were multiple medical practices that had their members suffer similar breaches of their, their payment card information. So. Um, as it turned out, there was no actual breach of the, the particular entity, and uh, that m usually turns out to be a trigger under cyber policy for coverage that there is a breach. Um, as it, yeah, in our view, they probably needed to check either you know, medical, medical practices, members that have been breached, probably needed to check the local country club or BMW dealership to find out if they'd been breached, since uh, yeah, it was just a peculiar grouping of doctors, but in that particular instance, the, yeah, the, the forensics investigation actually revealed no breach of the entity that they investigated. Jamie, we're talking about PHI, we're talking about breach response. There are often times where a breach has an impact in more than one jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on multi-state breaches and, and what that variable plays into the analysis upon a breach response? Sure. So typically our clients working with their legal counsel will determine what their notification requirements are. And with that information, we can um, uh, put together a uh, notification plan, an operational plan of how you're going to notify all of your customers given the different circumstances, your affected customers. So um, if there's a multi-state um, implication, then you're essentially just defaulting to the shortest notification timeline. So it's, uh, e even though you may be able to uh, order the notifications that go out um, with the most tightest, the tightest timelines first, you know, once the information's out, it's out. So you're launching the response to all of the affected customers, regardless of the state in the shortest timeline possible. And that goes back to the, the comment that um, that can be really, really difficult when you're talking about, you know, even 60 days, uh, but 15 days especially. So um, it, it's unrealistic that, to think that you can do that on a large scale um, if there's not some sort of planning and coordination in place. You know, Holly's comment earlier I think was a great one 
around um, one of the things that organizations don't realize is the burden that's put on their internal teams for things that they never really expected they would be doing outside of their normal roles and responsibilities. So dealing with escalations, whether they be from regulatory inquiries, you know, complaints to AGs from consumers driven by consumer complaints, um, or just people who are, are really upset and demanding um, uh, additional services or monetary compensation or whatever the case may be, somebody has to deal with those issues. And, um, uh, you know, the, the customer notification provider that you work with, if you choose to, if an organization chooses to work one, with one, can um, field a lot of those calls, but there's still some level of response that has to be handled by the organization itself. And that can get uh, very expensive um, and very taxing. But uh, one of the things that can be done is to work out those handoffs back and forth between you know, the response provider and um, the organization to make sure it's smooth, you're not creating additional challenges and pain by people feeling like they're you know, not being taken care of. The one bullet point that we haven't talked about yet um, is the regulatory investigation and the regulatory response. And that's why we're so fortunate to have Peggy on the stage. Um, the OCR um, has reported, these are, uh, these are actual reported settlements that were on the uh, OCR's website, their wall of shame. And these are historic from before, two, uh, these are 2014 and older, but there have been some settlements in 2015 that I was hoping Peggy would be able to talk more about. I'll just talk about them briefly, but just so you have an understanding of how these settlements come about, we've had approximately 1,300 um, breach reports that have been filed with our office involving 500 or more individuals. And there have been about 179,000 that have been filed that have involved less than 500. And most of those are about one or two people are affected. So it's the mismailing, the misfax documents, and that sort of thing. But with respect to the settlements, um, I think there's always something to take away from it, so I'll just talk about it very briefly. Um, cancer Care Group was one where there was an un uh, a workforce member had a bag in their car, and in it was an unencrypted laptop. I think it was their own laptop and an unencrypted um, backup drive of some sort, which was stolen. Um, you know, everybody knew that people were taking things home in their car and you know going back and forth from home with it. There was no policy or procedure. There were no device and media controls. Um, you know, this all goes back to risk analysis, of course. You know, where is your data? Where is it going? How are you using it? What are you doing with it after? How are you disposing of it? Um, so that was cancer care. Um, that was just last month. And then in July, there was St. Elizabeth's Medical Center, which was a little different. It resulted in a $218,000 resolution agreement in that um, workforce members were sharing documents on an internet-based app. I mean, we had another case earlier where they were using um, a calendar service. And they didn't have a business associate agreement with the provider and all the sorts of things, but, you know, where's the transmission security? No one was doing a risk assessment. Everyone knew that they were using it, but nobody was looking into it. It was just a convenient way to share documents. Um, Cornell Prescription Pharmacy, $125,000, a standalone pharmacy. They had an annual uh, party where they would purge all the records they didn't need to retain any longer. I wouldn't say it's a party, but it was a process they went through and they didn't have any procedures for it. So somebody found it in the dumpster. Um, you know, it wasn't um, secured in any way. It wasn't shredded. They just put it in the dumpster and that was it. So somebody found it. I mean, this was something I was gonna talk about a little later, but this issue of improper disposal seems like it's a small part of what's going on, but really we've had 27, I think all of those plus these um, on the last slide and this one, those are all the resolution agreements we've had. And basically five of them involve improper disposal. So pretty much one every year we've had um, regarding improper disposal. So that's just paper records we're talking about, not even security issues. Um, and then the last one, go back, I forgot what it was. Um, Anchorage Community Mental Health. Um, this one was, there was a breach reported because of malware. So malware is a question of transmission security again. Where are your firewalls? Um, you know, what's going on? Are you using the default settings? What's happening? You know, how is your data going back and forth? How are you protecting it? And then the other question is about patches. Patching is so easy and generally it's relatively inexpensive, but following up. So you have your risk analysis, you have your risk management plan in place, you've decided what you're going to do, but what are you doing to keep up with it? 
and patching is a big part of that. So that's the big takeaway from Anchorage. Peggy, I, I actually had a question for you, and I think if the answer is no comment, everyone will understand. <laughs> this uh, is like Vegas. I keep saying that. You know? <laughs> what happens here stays here. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So can you give us some insight into the methodology of arriving at the specific numbers? Yeah, I, I can give you a very vague answer. <laughs> um, basically, there are four levels. So this is under the new enforcement rule started in uh, February 18, 2009. So anything that happens before and after that changes the level of enforcement that we can um, pursue. Basically, at this point, there are four levels. And the four levels are, I think it starts with um, did not know, reasonable cause. Then there's willful neglect. Um, you fixed it within 30 days, and then willful neglect, you didn't fix it within 30 days. And the levels go from 100 to 50,000 up to, I think, up to 50,000 per violation with an annual cap of $1.5 million. Now, this is significant only in that a lot of the breach reports do involve the security rule, but it's more than one violation. So if we're talking about a standard, let's say, um, a stolen laptop. So right immediately in my head, I'm thinking, OK, encryption device and media control. Those are separate charges. Those could each go up to 1.5 million potentially. So even if you have a did not know, depending on how long it was going on, if you don't have a risk analysis in place since 2009, that's 1.5 per year you're counting up because that's going to be a per day situation until you can show us that, oh no, wait a minute, in 2012 we did come up with a risk analysis. Okay, so I'm going to stop counting there. Um, but it's just something to consider, even though the cap is 1.5, it could easily um, increase over time. And the one thing about encouraging clients to have um, some sort of breach plan is that we have had a resolution agreement where, um, I think it was adult and pediatric dermatology, where it was based on the fact that they didn't have policies and procedures for an incident um, of breach response. Peggy, the OCR is under the uh, Health and Human Services Department. Yep which is headed by a, a political person, a political appointee. From your perspective, where you're getting out in the field and, and handling this on a day-to-day -day professional basis, does it, is there a difference between which political appointee is sitting in HHS from your experience? Okay, I've had like four now. <laughs> I've been there 13 years. Someone, uh, one of our regional managers retired and she told me she's been under 17 directors and she couldn't even remember all their names. Um, I do think it changes only because each director has their own sort of thing that they're going to bring to the table. Um, our last director, um, Director Rodriguez, definitely was in the mindset of, you know, we're going to pursue these um, resolution agreements because it's a way of sort of pointing out where the flaws are. It's a teaching moment. There are things that we can discuss. Um, our current director, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but our office traditionally was, it's called the Office for Civil Rights because we have jurisdiction over about 30 different civil rights laws. So Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, the ADA. So we do those investigations as well, as well which seem sort of an anomaly compared to the HIPAA stuff. Um, it's not as a large part of our office currently. It's maybe about 10% of our work. Um, currently, our director is looking at those, trying to figure out you know, where do these two sorts of sets of jurisdictions fit. So I think definitely there is a shift. But without a doubt, the HIPAA high-tech stuff is you know, the key to what we have. And you know, these resolution agreements, not for nothing, this is definitely the opinion part. Um, they come back to the Office for Civil Rights now. They didn't used to. So we have an interest in doing that. As you know, um, I was a little concerned about being here today because there was going to be a government shutdown. I thought I wouldn't be able to come. I felt bad because two years ago this happened and I couldn't come because of the shutdown. So um, settlements definitely make a difference in our work. And just to clarify with that, you mean the settlements go to, I mean the actual funds that the fine that's being paid by the, by the health care entity is used by OCR in its operations? For further enforcement, yeah. So it's a self-funding agency? In, in, that in that regard. Respect. It's not the sole source, obviously. Sure. Okay. Um, we have, uh, Peg, I stay with Peggy for a while, we are talking um, uh, the following next few slides are statistics that I think all originally generate with HHS and so we don't have to read every single stat on every single slide but if you wanted to talk about um, some of the the statistics that we that we put into the presentation I, I'd welcome you to it's about 179 now okay <laughs> it's gone up <clears throat> and this one I know in particular wanted to comment on 
Uh, just the only thing I was going to say about this is that this goes by the types of breaches, and it's not by the number of individuals affected, because if it was the number of individuals affected, the hacking in IT definitely would be a much larger portion of the pie. But just as to what the cause of the breaches are that are being reported, um, so we investigate each one of them that comes in that's over 500. We open it up automatically. And theft and loss is definitely the largest part of it. Unauthorized dis access or disclosure includes insider threat. So you may have one rogue employee who's downloading tons of data just for selling, and there may be one or two that are, you know, just curious about what happened to their ex-boyfriend's girlfriend, you know, that sort of thing, and using it against them. Um, and then hacking in IT does go up every year. So a few years ago, it was only like 4 or 5%. And then improper disposal, which is what I talked about earlier, is that even though it's a small portion of it, um, we do have a, you know, a resolution agreement almost every year based on improper disposal, whether it be paper records, whether it be the data on a leased copier that is um, with uh, Parkview, uh, no affinity health. So you know, it, it's a small portion, but it's something to consider, it's something where your data is, basically. You need to know where it is. We talked about individuals impacted, and we do have some statistics on that. Again, I, this is generated from HHS, but so far in 2015, and I guess this a lot has to do with Anthem, um, the amount of individuals impacted has, uh, has skyrocketed. Um, additionally, um, the types of breach based on the number of breaches, still we're seeing unauthorized disclosure, like you just said, and theft is uh, leading the pack. Um, Peggy, talk about this next slide and its implications for the world outside of the cyber realm. You know, um, desktops, computers, laptops, portable devices, that is obviously a large portion, you know, it's to be expected. And then we start talking about email, the network server, and EMRs. Um, that's also a portion about 20 some odd percent. It's very close, though, to the paper records. So everyone talks about security, oh, I don't want to get hacked, mail, malware, and all this business. But paper records are still in the game. A lot of smaller organizations are using paper records. Um, you know, we still get cases where people are transferring stuff from uh, not, what are those slides? Not the not floppy disks, but microfiche, thank you. <laughs> a lot of people are still using microfiche. Um, we've had a few cases where microfiche is being digitized and you know, those companies are running off with the microfiche. They're not actually digitizing it. So. You have to consider what the paper records are out there. X-rays, probably another example of that. Yeah, X-rays, you know, a lot of dental X-rays are still out there. We, we had one where you talked about the ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend thing where uh, an, a nurse There photo are too many of those. I just want you to say <laughs> too many. Um, too many, right? We had one where the nurse photocopied um, a, uh, a venereal disease uh, evidence of her ex-boyfriend and put it underneath the windshield of, at the ex-boyfriend's wedding of all the people <laughs> in the cars. Um, but that had nothing to do with computers. It was all just paper. So. I call those the general hospital cases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting wedding favors. <laughs> <laughs> and this really, what we wanted to culminate with, and I think that most of you are giving advice to policyholders or clients, really want to talk about you know, what should we do. Um, and in this instance, we, we want to talk about best practices and, and preparedness. And we're probably going to spend a lot of time in this slide because everyone has something to say. So uh, why don't we start with Jamie. Um, explain a little, what, what tips it, um, and advice do you have um, for pre-breach avoidance techniques? Okay. So, um, you know, really, you know, our area of focus is on uh, breach preparedness and in the event of a, a, an event, in the event of a data breach or a data loss, um, how would you notify your customers and the customer facing aspects of your incident response plan? So everyone's doing um, incident response planning. It's the hot topic this year. Everybody's doing tabletops. Um, and we work with a lot of clients who are doing some aspect of incident response planning. But um, what we see when we look at those plans is the least mature parts are typically the ones that, uh, uh, the pieces that uh, relate to the customer facing aspects of the response. So um, how are you going to notify your consumers? How are you going to ensure that you have adequate capacity to meet the demands generated by notifying all of uh, your consumers at once uh, of this bad news? 
So the irony in that is um, these are the most challenging to pull off at scale with no planning and they're the most visible. So your customers, um, regulators, and the press are going to know if the phones aren't being answered in a timely manner or if people are getting the runaround or, or getting uh, wrong information. So um, as everyone um, is advising their clients on incident response planning, um, you know, that part of the plan needs to be more, the customer facing pieces of the plan need to be more than a, a name and a phone number. Uh, there's really a lot that can be done ahead of time to ensure that all of those hands off, handoffs and um, the way that the customers are treated um, is, um, is handled well. And I think the other thing is, is around those pieces, but capacity. So um, there's certainly been times uh, recently where the demand for services has um, outpaced uh, the available capacity of, of quality services. So, um, you know, especially when you're talking about forensics or the customer facing aspects of the response, call center, notification, identity protection services. Um, you know, it's, it can be on a first come first serve basis if those arrangements aren't already in place and there's guarantees around the response times. So um, when we talk about PHI breaches in particular and the regulatory requirements for notification um, in a certain time frame, um, plans really need to be in place to ensure that large organizations with a lot of records, a lot of data can um, respond in the time that they need to, otherwise it's you know, delays and, and fines. Now, Holly, you have spent a lot of time dealing with this issue on a first-person mm -hmm. point of view. Would you give us your take on breach preparedness, breach avoidance? Okay. I think to look, extend a little bit on what Jamie said, when it talks about an incident response or your risk management plan, it's really relatively new that cyber has really been addressed. You know, as hospitals or healthcare sites, we've always had disaster plans, both for external and internal disasters, and it could be a team of multiple people. When it comes to who's going to be responsible for a cyber response, that team has to be very small and very confined. It has, there has to be an executive who's going to be the number one person and personal Again, you know, my personal opinion, it is not to be the CIO. They are way too close to what's going on. And sometimes they're in the position that they're defending some of their actions, maybe before you brought forensics in. But it's got to be an individual who has been given full authority by both the board and the CEO that if there's a decision that has to be made, it really stops with that individual. The team definitely has to have the CIO and the CSO on it, and probably the CEO for a very brief period of time. And PR is also very critical. You do not bring any Anybody in to this group at all unless they have a specific purpose. I, I think when I look at all the different disaster scenarios that we are faced with, this is probably needs to be the tightest control just because you really don't know what your message is yet. Until you've done your investigation, you need to make this team you know, very small in the beginning. We talked about education a little bit, and it's got to be education of everybody. Definitely you're going to educate your boards, you're going to educate your you know, senior teams. Definitely need to talk about education to IT people, not just these, you know, the CIO, but to all those individuals who may be involved in doing some of the work. I also suggest that you have really like whole house education, because I think most of the people who are working for us now have had some kind of breach of something. It's been Target, it's been Home Depot, it's been all the ones that we've talked about. So they know that that is out there, but people need to have the facts, and the facts have to be the same no matter if it is the board who's layering the facts or the maintenance workers. Everything has got to be the same, so there's, there's consistency all the way around. I also think that if your organization has been lucky enough that they did purchase the insurance, that you know who's on your panel. I think the worst thing is, is all of a sudden you get the phone call at 7 o'clock at night, usually a Friday night, that something has happened and you haven't got a clue who the panel was because either who bought the insurance may not be the same person who is now that executive in charge, but these are things you need to know ahead of time. 
you know, also just be prepared as we talked about the human capital that's involved with people working is that just know ahead if you are that senior exec, you are going to be tied to that breach coach to the hip for the next how many days, hours, or whatever, which, you know, I think that's something you've got to really be prepared for when organizations take on this responsibility. The other thing that I think Peggy might have mentioned a little bit too is to really do you know, risk assessment and IT vulnerability. Suggestion is it is not always done by your same team. You know, there are experts out there, a lot of them are sitting in this room who you can bring in because sometimes, you know, especially when we're talking about small companies or small healthcare organizations who do not maybe have the most sophisticated organizations working on them, they really do not know what they do not know. And I think this is, is a big point is to make sure that you do have these vulnerability analysis that are done with everything. And we've already talked about policies and um, you know, doing tabletops and, you know, being prepared. But, I mean, these are the things that you need to have in place before it even happens to you. And, and just to build a little bit on Jamie's point about deficiencies in these plans, I, I think what's very common what I see when an organization has taken the step of developing the plan, the plan is decidedly network security focused, um, which makes sense. That's the biggest exposure. However, you look at, the, you know, some of the stats that, that Peggy spoke about, and it's more probable than not that you'll have to be dealing with a non-technical incident. And it's good to have that all funneled through one central framework. The organization handles everything the same. Information is information. It doesn't matter what medium it's stored in. The process works the same way. Rich, talk more about what um, Holly's comment was about the teams and about your, your panels. And, you, you know, this, Jamie and Holly's been a lot of talking about pre-breach. -be mm -hmm. And that's all well and good. But we're here because there are breaches all the time. Right. Uh, there is a breach. Talk about the role of the team, the response team. Sure, and uh, yeah, I think it's safe to say at this point that most insurers in this sector do have uh, vendors in place, or if not, you know, they may be doing things themselves as well, um, but to assist in all aspects of the breach, whether it be legal counsel as breach coaches, um, forensics companies, um, uh, credit monitoring companies, um, notification companies and, and the like to you know jump in and assist on a breach immediately um, you know for, for our company we have a list of those preferred vendors that you know we have relationships with and we can have you know move forward in very rapid order to respond to a breach in all aspects of the breach um, I would add also pre breach you know it, it's probably a good thing for companies to get to know their carriers and to reach out to their, you know, to their claims people so that they kind of know who they're going to deal with uh, in the event of a breach. And, uh, you know, I, I think it's safe to say also that most insurers would be happy to, you know, have their claims people spend time with prospective and, you know, and insurers that they've actually written to discuss, discuss with them, uh, you know, the, the procedures that would be in place in the event of a breach. And, you know, even if the companies are in good weather locations, uh, have, a, have a personal visit. So. <laughs> One uh, quick, maybe a practical point of risk management. Um, it is an incident response plan, right? So it's not a breach plan. Mm -hmm. um, let's avoid using that term. It's a loaded term. And what it means in a network security context is not what it means under a given statute. Was the data accessed or was it exfiltrated? Well, that may turn the entire incident into a breach. So we don't know. So the initial stages of discovery, train your folks to, to avoid that B word. It's a, it's a bad word. I think, too, the one thing that we have to have, too, is to make sure, and again, we talked about, at least I believe, as far as your core team, you have to have PR or communication people. But sometimes the people that you have, depending upon the size of your organization, may not be up to what you may need to be doing when it comes to communication. So, you know, some of the insurers do allow you to have, you know, a PR, a national firm PR which is, you know, something that I see a lot of the organizations do, that you contact them immediately after you've talked to your carrier and you have play statements there. Because I think what happens in many cases is that, you know, this is something brand new and everybody's got their opinion, you know, about what's supposed to happen. But you still have to be, and I think that's why you have to have this exec who is working constantly with the coach, because that breach coach knows all the rules. You know, everybody can be self-guessing. It could be the IT person saying, oh my God, we have to hurry up and do this because we're required to report in this many days. When it happens, you know, people's, all those plans and those instant response things 
things are there and you never think you're going to use them. So even the best laid plans, you know, people, you know, react to just as normal, you know, emotional things at that time. So again, that, that coach has got to be there and it's got to be real standard and real specific to what's going on at that time. But doesn't your policyholder, Paula Rich, have, you know, their uncle that's a lawyer that can handle this case? <laughs> Sometimes. Um, uh, you know, it's part of our job to make sure that, uh, you know, if an insured wants to use, or the policyholder wants to use their uncle, if the uncle isn't experienced in the sector, um, it, it's our job to really educate the insured and or the broker to try to ensure that uh, a proper response is, is performed and that the appropriate professionals are brought in there. To use the healthcare analogy, if you're going in for a knee operation, you want someone that does only knee operations and nothing but knee operations. You don't want somebody that dabbles in knee operations. I would hey. definitely add to that because um, we get breach reports from all kinds of people in all levels. We've had secretaries file reports. They don't even realize what they're filing sometimes. Um, they put their contact name down and I call them to verify it before we post it. And they're looking at me like, oh, I wasn't involved. I, I got this, you know, I was dictated this. I was supposed to put it in up to the lawyer who has never done anything related to breach reporting, has no idea what the security requirements are. Um, you want somebody who's qualified. If you're going to hire counsel, do it right. Peggy, what else from the OCR point of view do you look for um, when you're evaluating preparedness and uh, a particular claim? Every single breach report that we investigate, we ask for um, a set of documents. Usually they're related to the incident. So if it's a device, we'll ask for device and media control. If it's a theft, you know, in a facility, we'll ask for the facility security plan. But for sure, every single one, you can bring it back to the risk analysis. I know a lot of people talk about that. I think there was a gentleman here, Mr. Cronin, he's out here somewhere, who's asking about, you know, why isn't there a standard one? Because once you make it standard, someone is going to fall off. <laughs> They're not going to be able to meet it, or it's not going to meet their needs sufficiently. But the risk analysis, it can be one piece of paper. If you only have one computer, maybe you only have one risk. You only have one employee. If you have 100 employees, obviously it's going to be much greater. The risk analysis is always the thing that we look at. Then the next thing we look at is the risk management plan. And not only that, what have you been doing with it since? Um, you know, security rule risk analysis has been around since you know, 2006, 2009, you know. Um, what's happened since then? What are your policies date? Are they dated, you know, 2006 and no one's looked at it since? There's no revision date? Nobody ever brought it to the board for approval? These are all things that, you know, constantly need to be picked at. And those are the things we look at when we, when we are picking through, you know, the 700 pages that people send us and we're all groaning because it won't even fit on the, on the data, one data disk. Um, you know, the risk analysis is the most important thing. And I think everybody's been talking about that, but I definitely, for purposes of the security rule, for a breach, if you have all your ducks in a row with your risk analysis and your risk management plan, no matter what happened, what can OCR say? You are ready and you did what you needed to do. It's going to happen. It's just, what did you do to prepare for it? We have uh, just two minutes left, and so I wanted to take that time. Uh, this wasn't on a slide or anything, but if we could play, put on our, uh, our uh, put the crystal ball out on the table, and I would ask the panel to just to do uh, 30 seconds on, um, it's optional, I <laughs> have to do it. Um, if we're here next year, beautiful Santa Monica, what are we going to be talking about on the PHI stage? Jamie? Yeah, I, I think that um, timelines um, are a big thing to consider. So while the timelines are, are tight, um, the regulatory timelines for notification are tight. The one thing that we're seeing more and more of is that timeline collapsing because investigative journalists like Brian Krebs and others are um, outing organizations before they're ready to talk about it. Um, so while you think you have the luxury of up to 60 days um, to get your customer notification plan in place, you may not have that luxury as a healthcare organization. Um, so uh, there's always a lot of, um, you know, and I don't see that going away. I, I think that those types of uh, public outings will become more and more prevalent, uh, more frequent. 
Um, so it just goes back to the need for, for preparedness. And if you have to launch a, a huge response in, in just a couple of days because you're forced to, um, you know, it's adding to the expense, it's adding to the pain uh, if that's not handled well. Rich? You meant it when you said optional, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Um, um, just real briefly, I, I think uh, perhaps we'll be talking about some resolutions in the litigation and regulatory aspects of the Anthem breach maybe next year. Paul? A, a increase in the sophistication of malware and technical attacks against healthcare companies. I, I think that's where this is all headed. Just like there are some very smart folks in, in the Bay Area and the Silicon Valley that sit and write some very useful software, there are equally smart folks on other parts of the world that, that write malicious software. Um, they're getting better and better. Um, companies are getting better at detecting them, which is almost kind of increasing the amount of incidents you hear about. Um, so a continued arms race, and it's, it's a challenging one for healthcare companies to keep up with. Holly, crystal ball one year from now? I think to have an increased awareness by healthcare organizations that it can happen to you no matter what your size is. If you're 50 beds or you're 1,000 beds or if you're in long-term care or if you're a physician, you know, clinic is, and then to make sure that you have got those plans because I think that's one of the biggest issues that we face. Peggy? Uh, hopefully next year we'll be talking about the high-tech audits and um, they'll be rolling along soon. I think notices are going out. Real, what are the high-tech audits, please? Yeah. What oh, oh uh, the high-tech audits, um, there are audits mandated under high-tech, so it asks OCR basically to look at not just complaints and um, breach reports, but to consider by doing an audit of the entire industry what's going on, because we know that not everyone has done a risk analysis. You can talk about it, it seems so obvious, but um, a lot of organizations don't do it. So what are the organizations that are failing at it? Why are they failing at it? Is it something that we can do or not do? So we've had one round and there was a lot to learn from that. This time around we're doing it in-house um, and so it should be interesting to see what they discover because as a result of that, that is going to change. Um, I have a feeling rulemaking is probably going to be in the future. Well, I want to thank everybody on the panel and thank all of you. Uh, we don't really have time for questions. Uh, if you do have any questions, we're all in the, the Net Diligence app. Um, my firm's cool pens are on the table. Feel free to find me there. And uh, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Nice job. Nice job. Okay, we're going to, for our next panel to come up, we're going to move on to the in encryption session. Did I thank Markel for the break earlier? Thanks, Markel, for the break earlier. Oh, Winston Crone is uh, uh, moderating. Did you lock the doors? <laughs> Winston is not allowed to say that he is the only thing standing between you and the cocktail reception. I just want to get that out of there now. Still make funniest lines. It's your. Kids, <laughs> 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 the audience.
I don't want to take the glory from you guys. Do I have a deck? Yeah, I do. And I've sent it through. And I got a, I got yes uh, confirmation that we have it. You're pretty sure it's a 